Hi, everyone. This is Charles Hoskinson, broadcasting pre-recorded from warm, sunny Colorado. Today's video has a very special audience. It is made for the legendary Nick Zabo. He's been in our space since before our space existed. Uh, we knew of Nick from his work on smart contracts. I have an article right here, smart contracts, building blocks for digital markets, copyright 1996. Gives you a sense of how, uh, how long he's been doing these things. He's the OG of OGs. Recently, uh, there was some Twitter confusion about the nature of Cardano's governance system and how it relates and are we centralized, are we not centralized, and there's a lot to the story. And, you know, if it was a normal Twitter person, I'd just be like, meh, but it's Nick. And I know Nick, I've talked to him many times throughout the years, and I think that um, it'd be good to discuss some of the things we're thinking about. I don't care if Nick agrees or disagrees, uh, but he has earned the right uh, to have a dialogue and for us to make videos explain who we are what we're thinking about what problems we're trying to solve above the social media fray actually get into details so this one's going to be a long one hold on to your butts it's going to be a fun one though i'm going to enjoy it and hopefully nick you enjoy it too let me know what you think you know we uh write a lot of papers we do a lot of cool stuff you did a lot of cool stuff still do a lot of cool stuff what code dry code okay so Let's talk a little bit about the transaction. You know, when we think about blockchains, blockchains are these vehicles that live out in the cloud and they're either permissioned or permissionless and they're either public or private. Uh, but on the permissionless public side, which is what Bitcoin is, really there are three things that you tend to deal with. You tend to deal with identity, you tend to deal with value and you tend to deal with governance, implicit or explicit. Uh, so value is where we started in a Bitcoin land. We created this notion of a Bitcoin and you can just teleport it anywhere in the world as a push transaction. Uh, and the identities were addresses inside the systems. And so people would send something from one address to another in a very simple system, one to one, one to many, many to one or many to many. Okay. It supported all four of those transaction patterns, but you can only move one type of value and there's only one type of identity and there's no explicit governance system. Okay. Now, when you build an application that deals with these types of things, that application has this concept of trust. Now, the social contract of Bitcoin is Bitcoin is the honey badger. It does not care. It does not change to accommodate the whims and wills of an individual. So the better job you do at being resilient in the face of an adversary for your application space, the higher the trust goes. So you have this notion of an adversary. And then you have this notion of resilience. Oops. Okay, so the more resilience, stronger the adversary, trust goes up. Now, the fundamental unit of operation of change, the unit of change in these types of systems is the transaction. And the transaction really deals with five things, four direct, one meta. So first, transactions deal with the movement of value. So core to our space when we're in the blockchain industry, whether you're public, private, permission, permissionless, you really think a lot about value representation. And in our industry, we have things like commodities. And that's what Bitcoin has been termed as, a digital commodity. You have securities. So for example, security tokens, you'll see STOs, these types of things. You have non-fungible tokens. You have utility tokens. You have many different representations of value. You can represent intellectual property. You could do complex things, like you could do an NFT that also has a security component. So you can have a Pokemon card and have fractional ownership of that Pokemon card. So you issue a Pokemon token, and then for your Pikachu, you have 100 shares, and each of them represents fractional ownership of it. So you can layer these things together. But in general, there's the representation of value and then the ways you can move that value, okay? So Bitcoin is a push-only system. Alice sends to Bob. 
You also have pull payments, for example, like credit card subscriptions where Bob pulls funds from Alice, like you subscribe to a magazine or you subscribe to an app or something like that, like the call map, and every month it takes something out. Then you also have contingent. Okay, so contingent movement of value is where you say something like if then. Uh, you have some predicates, and then if they are true, then you execute. So you have your predicates. Do stuff. And these can be complex interactive puzzles. For example, let's say you want to donate some money to a foundation. You say, okay, uh, I'll only donate if you sign this particular donation deed. So this is an interactive two-party transaction where you send a deed over, they must sign it. If they sign it, then the transaction will settle. Okay, so contingent settlement. So you have push, you have pull, you have contingent. And then you have different representations of value. So that's the first property of a transaction, the unit of change in the blockchain system. The second is identity. And identity is all about who is involved. So as I said before, you can do one to one, one to many, many to one, or many to many. These are our four types that Bitcoin supports. But identity is basically, uh, it can be something like a DID, a decentralized identifier. It can be an address. It can be hard-coded entities. You see this a lot in permission uh, blockchains where they have uh, a quorum of pre-selected actors and only those people can run the system. And then they can be public all the way to private. And that's a spectrum. Bitcoin is a pseudonymous system. So it's not quite private. It's not quite public. You are representing an identity with a code and that code is the address. But there are ways to link it. If it's completely unlinkable using modern techniques, then it's truly a private system. But as your name, it's a public system. If it's directly linked, you've actually docked yourself. Okay. Then you also have metadata. Okay, so the metadata is the story of the transaction. The way I like describing this is you can have the very same identity, the same type of transaction, and the same value, but different metadata have radically different interpretations of the nature and the legality of that transaction. So, for example, imagine Bob. And I'll give you two scenarios for Bob. So scenario one is Bob withdraws $300 of a stable coin, which is translated to cash by the ATM, in front of an Italian restaurant at noon. You'd say, oh, he's getting some cash to, pay his, uh, to take his friends out for lunch. Now, let's say Bob withdraws $300 at 2 a.m., right next to a brothel. You'd say, okay, he's paying for a hooker. Okay, same amount, same person, different timestamp, different location. That's metadata. And metadata is the story of the transaction. Story around the transaction. Bitcoin only supports op return for this and Satoshi made this highly limited in his initial design, uh, and rightfully so. Metadata can be very cumbersome, and oftentimes that is more important than the actual contents of the transaction. These can be quite small. They can be in the bytes. Metadata can be in the gigabytes or larger. It can contain arbitrary amounts. Okay. Then the last of the explicit properties is the contractual relationship, the contractual compart. So basically, why and the terms and conditions. These are the things that you're looking at. So this is what Sabo, you were the king of and inspired us with Ethereum to think about what type of deterministic contractual relationships can we construct and when can they be non-deterministic and uh, when do you need information within the system versus outside of the system? It's a rich and deep field, but basically it's, you're not just sending money. Bob isn't just sending money. 
for some reason. He's withdrawing it to do something with it. And if he's sending it to himself, there's an implication he has the right to receive it. If he's sending it to another, it's for something. It's a donation. It's a gift. It's a purchase. It's a service contract, whatever it may be. Now, all four of these things live nested within a concept of regulation. That's the fifth property. And regulation it basically takes a look at the contract. It takes a look at the metadata. It takes a look at the identities of the actors. And it takes a look at the value. And it's nested within geographies. This is a meta property of a transaction. And basically, in our systems, it's entirely possible to build things where you are under the regulations of multiple jurisdictions, in some cases, contradictory ones. Bitcoin doesn't have a lot to say about contractual relationships. It does have a scripting language that was based on a language called Forth. And it's a stack-based assembly, and it's not very complex. And I suppose it's Turing complete, but it might as well not be. It's, it's not very useful for complex contractual relationships, especially when you deal with contingencies, especially when you want to deal with off-chain data like Oracle feeds and so forth. So there's no batteries included here. Metadata, there's the app return, but there's not much more to say about that. There's no native identity system for Bitcoin outside of the address structure. And on the value side, Bitcoin only represents one asset, the commodity that is a Bitcoin. It has no provisions for a multi-asset ledger. Although there were attempts to add this in with projects like Color Coins. And uh, there are, of course, their successors, Master Coin and Color Coins and so forth. And for years, people have been thinking about it. Uh, but most of the token issuance has been replaced by Ethereum and later projects because of the ease and liquidity and so forth. Okay, so what does this have to do with governance? Governance is about managing complexity, ultimately. Simple systems can either be self-governing, as in the case of Bitcoin, or they can be governed with mild human interaction. Okay, If all your neighbors are rich, you all have 10,000 acres, and you're all next to each other, you mostly keep to each other, and you know, you're so far away you can't hear or see each other, you don't really have a need for an HOA okay? because whatever they paint the barn, it's not going to bother you. If they go out and listen to loud rock music and weld all day long, it's not going to bother you. You can't see or hear it. And so that's an example of a simple relationship. Now, if you're hyper urbanized and very dense and you have 50,000 people in a small area, then suddenly you have a complex HOA, which is highly regulated because small things that people do can have very big impacts. So governance is all about managing complexity, and good governance gives you flexibility and adaptability. Okay, that's really the goal of good governance. You start with an intent, to, you have values, you have philosophy. You have a notion of a social contract in a system. Even Bitcoin has a social contract. The monetary policy, for example, every person who owns Bitcoin, participates in Bitcoin, they kind of sign up for that social contract and they explicitly or implicitly validate that. Okay, And governance basically encodes those types of things. And then it says, OK, we're going to somehow manage the complexity that our system has. Now, the reason why I bring up all this stuff about the unit of change of a system is the more that you want to do here, the more useful. If you can do all these things, you can have a story about regulation, you have a sophisticated contracting system, you make provisions for metadata that's very sophisticated, you have a lot of identity provisions that are very sophisticated, and you have the ability to represent many different types of value and do many different types of transactions, that system is very complicated. Okay, And what that means is that you're not going to be able to have a simple governance system. Your protocol becomes very fat. You're also going to have a constellation of services around it, 
And then you're also going to require lots of maintenance and change. Maintenance because you have more than one protocol and lots of infrastructure change because the more complex the system, the higher the probability is you're going to screw something up. The problem is that every time you change, you hurt trust if the change is done without consent. So how do you solve this? This is the problem of the third generation cryptocurrencies. We want to give you everything. We want to give you peer-to-peer -peer lending. We want to be a world financial operating system. We want to be able to allow an, an interplay with complex identities and zero knowledge crypto and lots of metadata. We'd like to have very sophisticated contractual relationships, both on chain and off chain and so forth. And actually, when you talk about scale, if I am legitimate and say, I want to have millions to billions of users, you're going to have millions of bobs. You're going to have billions of Bob's analysis. And every single one of them has opinions about how the system should work, what the system should do, the level of regulatory oversight the system should have, the geographies the system is allowed to play in and not. That social contract gets very dicey, and the philosophy gets very dicey, and the values get very dicey. The Bitcoin philosophy basically says that as your system scales in terms of users and value, the rate of change slows down. Why? Because there's no coordination mechanism for it. You have core developers, you have miners, but you have too many people to get into a room and discuss and do things. Okay, so that means that the protocol gets more stable, but static. Now, if the protocol is just simply thinking about one thing, saying we are a transaction system that's going to move a particular unit of value with a fixed identity space, a fixed way of doing metadata, and never support smart contracts the way our industry is doing, and we're going to continue the same monetary policy the same data policy and the same design, this is a feature. It's a very strong, compelling feature, and it's something that builds trust and reliability. But if the system desires to add new smart contracting models, sidechain models, new consensus models, it desires to upgrade and update itself quickly, then this would be a bug. So it really depends on what you make it to be. And if Bitcoin wants to be this, this is a completely legitimate way of doing things. And who's to argue with the trillion dollar market cap? It makes a lot of sense. But this was never the raison d'etre of Cardano. Cardano, we wanted to build an on-chain government. And so what we were thinking about is saying, okay, first we need an update system. Then second, we need some sort of uh, consent-driven process. Then we need some way of representing the blueprints. Okay? And then we need meaningful participation. You need all of these things if you're actually going to succeed in some co concept of a governance system. And that governance system must be universal, meaning that it has the capacity to change with enough participation over enough time the social contract, the philosophy the values of the system, and add dramatic new capabilities to the system. So first off, we had to construct a lot of theory to get to an update system for cryptocurrencies, and we created something called the hard fork combinator. So 
So basically what this does is it creates a superset every time you initialize it. So you have the Byron era. Then all of a sudden you go to the Shelley era, which is now larger. And then you go to the Gogan era. And each time you do this, you maintain support for the past, but you gain new capabilities and features. So you have backwards compatibility through, and it's an easy way to sort all of that out. The theory behind how to do that changing consensus and other things like Byron went from a static and federated system to Shelley, a dynamic and decentralized system with different consensus protocols is very complex, but we had to invent that. We also had to invent a way of doing decentralized software updates. So we wrote a paper about decentralized software updates uh, through a European Union project that we did called uh, through the Horizons 2020 program. And this is called uh, from the privilege consortium. Okay. Uh, and we worked on it with IBM and um, guard time and we were doing our part and they did their part. So the science of an update system, we thought about a lot and we got to a point where we feel pretty comfortable with how to do that. But then there's this question of who's in control. The problem is that you kind of need the rest of this stuff before that update system can be fully decentralized. Otherwise, you have a committee, that's where we're at now, that are basically in charge of that process. Now, it's easy to decentralize it naively. You could just be like, all right, anybody who has ADA can decide. But then is that meaningful? You know, are, is it consent-driven? Does the community feel like enough people participated? You know, was there high enough voting thresholds and these types of things? Uh, and also, is it a good idea to open up such a voting system and allow people to change everything potentially? Or is there are certain things that must be static and fixed. And this is actually a really big experiment that we're conducting and we're thinking about through Catalyst. So the very same thing that we're doing to give away money via grants through the treasury system is incentivizing people lots of people to have to participate so lots of people over 10,000 now okay and the very same thing that we're doing uh to get to the point of what is good for cardano asking when people submit grants and we check those grants and so forth well that becomes meaningful participation that's a kpi that we track the level of engagement that people have it's real good information good idea flow and so forth uh, that stuff makes sense. Okay. And eventually it'll be universal because it'll be able to cover all the system parameters and also SIPs, Cardano Improvement Proposals, uh, that, uh, that actually will require an HFC event. So the idea is that over time, Catalyst will evolve, that we will have enough people, enough checks and balances, enough experts, enough meaningful participation that the entire update system can be fully decentralized. My belief is that that will be accomplished sometime either this year or next year. Uh, and then the system will be resilient and stable, but it will be able to scale. So this is the other thing that you have to think about. Works at scale. I do not want a situation that as the users and value go up, the rate of change goes down in the system. Because if that's the case, we can't compete. The other people are going to come and eat our lunch, and then the fourth generation protocol will get us. I want a situation where the system is self-evolving and keeps growing and so forth. Okay? And there are many things we can do to bootstrap it, but at the end of the day, the system must be inevitably on the update side fully decentralized. So then there's a question of, well, why should ADA holders decide that? Well, the problem with the proof-of-work versus proof-of-stake system is that if you hold a Bitcoin, you have no say. Bitcoin is controlled by different constituencies. It's controlled by miners who are exogenous. They're outside of the system, and they're not connected to the ownership of Bitcoin. You have developers who are outside of the system, not compensated by the system, and they may have incentives for the system or otherwise. Who knows? It's entirely possible that 
a group of developers can be co-opted and work for the government, and their goal is to slow down or destroy the currency. We call that a gold finger attack. Okay. Then you have the infrastructure. So these are the coin bases of the world and the wallet providers and other such people. And they have a huge amount of control over the cryptocurrency because what they can do is say, we're only going to support A or B. If there's a fork, we're going to support this fork over this fork for like, for example, Bitcoin versus Bitcoin cash. Okay. And there's a balance of power between these, but the holders have no say. So Michael Saylor went and put a billion dollars or whatever into Bitcoin and Elon Musk put a lot of money into Bitcoin. He has really no say at all in the governance at all of the system. Proof of stake has a very different philosophy. The operators of the system operate with the blessing of the holders through delegation. So those who hold the asset actually have a say. Now there are still developers, but the developers, if Catalyst works correctly, will be financed by the network, which means they work for the blockchain, they work for the government or anybody else. And the infrastructure players still do actually have some power. And you have to carefully think about the infrastructure players uh, if you're going to do things properly. Like, for example, you have to figure out ways to make sure that exchanges can't vote with the tokens and exchanges can't stake or they're staking on behalf of the will of holders and so forth. So it makes a lot of sense when you're talking about the operation of the system being at the discretion of the holders to also say that the holders should have a more significant say in the governance of the system because ultimately they're the ones who are uh, keeping things aligned. You know, the miners keep the developers and the infrastructure people somewhat in checks and balance. You don't have those social dynamics with proof of stake. You have to have a different type of social dynamic. So with a POS system, you know, you have to do things a little differently and that's okay. What's really interesting is that because governance can be based upon tokens, over time, what you can do is actually create more tokens. Not the underlying asset, but rather governance tokens that are connected to things that people value within the system. Maybe growth and adoption or uh, being a developer or so forth. And then you can weight governance this way. We call this kind of like a proof of merit kind of idea. And this is something that we're actively researching and looking at. And there's a lot of things like what happened with Gitcoin and, and so forth. Uh, or open source development contributions and so forth that are really interesting. And I think there's some cool things over the next five years that we can start chasing, which means that you move from a plutocratic system to a meritocratic system, which is the ultimate notion of fairness and representative democracies. Okay. And also this allows governments to form because operators operate at the consent of the governed. Those holders can also delegate their votes to experts, and inevitably you'll have the notion of a crypto congressman or a crypto senator uh, who can come in and rep represents a lot of value. So he personally does not control a lot, but has access to a lot of value and power and so forth. Okay, now representing the blueprints, this is something Bitcoin does not have. Bitcoin is not aware of its own design. And this is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, and it's something that Tezos people and, and our people, we actually agree on. Um, we do formal methods at IOHK. And that's not just a buzzword. Formal methods is a software development process. And basically what you do is you go and write a specification. And then you go through a process with that specification, like model checking and so forth, to match the semantical intent. Once that's done, you have a design, then you can write the code for the system, and then you can certify the code. Okay, so a little green check mark saying that the code is correct by construction. This is a very expensive, very time consuming, and very difficult thing to do, but it makes sense for a certain class of code, aerospace software, medical software, cryptographic code, code you intend on reusing for years to decades, there were correctness matters a lot. Well, 
it is entirely possible at a 10 to 20 year time horizon that you can construct a cryptocurrency that is aware of its own design. What's really cool about that then is that your update system would no longer update clients like Daedalus and Uroi and these types of things. Rather, the update system would update a series of blueprints that live on chain. Okay, so you would have version Cardano one, and then you'd update to Cardano two. Then what you can do is construct a protocol where clients are certified. So the client developer has to produce a proof that their client follows the blueprint. And it's self-certified. So they actually produce the proof and then you can verify the proof against some sort of very low level blueprint verification language. Okay, so maybe check. X. Now, why is this relevant? It means that uh, basically when you're voting, you're voting on the design of the system, the canonical protocol, but then people are free to build whatever clients they want. They can diverge a bit, but the core parts of the client must be certified against that. This is another area of active research that we're doing, and we're slowly but surely looking at proof carrying code and all kinds of crazy techniques in the programming language space to try to figure out how to do this. And it's something that we're going to first introduce with dApps uh, because it's so important to get those protocols right or else they blow up and people lose all their money. But inevitably, I'm going to pull that into the system itself. The reason being is that the developers on both sides are not decentralized. Okay, This is an invitation-only club in Bitcoin. I can't be a member of it. You know, and Maybe one day if I know the right people. You know, It's just very hard to actually be in that set. And, you know, who has Git access? You know, who actually gets to play around with these things? And then there's going to be a million people that say, oh, Charles is talking out of his ass. I really don't care. I've had this fight for 10 years. <laughs> but uh, we can all agree that the source code for the foundations of the system, the things you need for the reference client in the design, should be on chain or validated through something on chain, such as a hash representing it. Why? Because then that means that no one gets to decide how to update the system's code. You only get to update that through some sort of process with consent of the actors in the system. Okay? And this is something we're looking at. I would love to integrate in Cardano 25, 2025, uh, something like Git and Git Access using Prism uh, and actually store all this source code for the reference client of Cardano on chain. And actually the blueprints I would love to represent in a language like Agda or Idris because they do code generation as well and they can create a reference client that people can certify against and do all of these things on chain. And then who has access to these things and can actually update these things would be a consent-based process where there is voting involved. So the decentralization of developers is a very difficult thing, and it's something we have to think a lot about. And that's for infrastructure. That infrastructure, this is what DeFi is about. That can be decentralized. You know, you don't like exchanges, there's peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and so forth. Uh, so the DeFi revolution is giving us infrastructural decentralization, and that's great. Operator decentralization is achieved by having economic incentives and encourage you to have more operators, not less operators. And we've achieved that with Cardano as well, whereas Bitcoin has the opposite relationship. So it's a very complex topic and there's a lot of moving pieces. And the reality is that you can solve the topic with a straw man solution, the naive solution, you know, the discrete topology solution by basically saying stable but static. So if you go up here and say, I'm only going to do a small set of these things, value identity, metadata, and contractual relationships, and I don't care about regulation. It is very easy to build a simple protocol. And as we've seen with Bitcoin, that protocol has achieved billions, now trillions of dollars of value. That's good. Nick, good work. Congratulations.
But with Cardano, we're a whole different animal. First, we don't have miners to keep us in check and balance. We have operators, and those operators are already given consent by a process. And then we said it makes no sense to stop there. Those holders should have some process where they can meaningfully participate and have a discussion over where the system should go. We invented this hard fork combinator. We invented a decentralized update system. And this has allowed us to upgrade things very easily as supersets. And right now we're operating that in a federated mode because it takes time to build the social dynamics to get to a point to make that decentralized. And there's a clear scope of work that people expect already. They expect Genesis, they expect Hydra, they expect smart contracts and multi-asset. There's already a social contract for the delivery of those features. Cardano 2025, there's a new social contract. That means there's a different notion of how to update the type of system. Catalyst will get us there because it keeps growing. But then we have to really think about some foundational things. And these are big research topics of how do you get your foundations and your code on chain? And how do you get the access to that and the curation of that through a consent-driven process? Catalyst will give us that. DeFi will decentralize our infrastructure. And uh, there we go. And we'll get many, many, many developers. And then the blueprint certification process using formal methods, which we've already started, will inevitably allow anyone to write a client and those clients to have the same level of trust and assurance and security as the clients that I build. Okay, so you've decentralized competition in that respect. A lot of moving pieces, and this is why Cardano is so ambitious, and this is why we had to write 100 damn papers, and this is why uh, it takes a lot of time to really wrap your mind around the things that we're doing. Um, if you want to abandon simplicity and you want to embrace complexity, the complexity requires you to be flexible and adaptable. Complexity is very hard to maintain, and complexity requires you to change a lot. And we wish to do so without trust decay. And that's ultimately what these systems are about, is trust. So anyway, Nick, that's the beginning of the dialogue. I'd love to hear uh, what you have to say about a blog post or video or just tweet bullshit or something. Doesn't matter. You're an OG. You've earned the right to do whatever the hell you want to do. And you've earned the right to get a video anytime you want to. Uh, you're in this uh, for life. There are the patron saints of the church. Uh, and uh, the church of Satoshi Nick Zabo is definitely one of them. So um, thank you so much for playing. We appreciate it. And watch our progress. Might not like it today, but as we continue to decentralize and we continue to make progress on this, I do have a belief that these things could be imminently useful for Bitcoin. If anything, the formal methods process can allow a explicit encoding of the original intent of the system. And maybe that'll make it a little easier to ensure that you keep staying in feature land. And if you ever do want to start changing the system and adding things, uh, we're a first mover showing how to do that properly. And if you guys are interested, Nick wrote a lot of really cool things, and we would not exist without him. So I'd highly recommend that you actually start looking through those cool things, and perhaps they'll be of equivalent value to you as they were to me. And that, as Paul Harvey would say, is the rest of the story. Thanks for listening.